The Contender, Chapter 1. He waited on the stoop until twilight, pretending, pretending to watch the sun melt into the dirty gray Harlem sky. Up and down the street, transistor radios clicked on and hummed into the sour air. Men dragged out card tables, laughing. Cars cruised through the garbage and broken glass, older guys showing off their Friday night girls. Another five minutes, he thought. I'll give James another five minutes. You still here, Alfred? Aunt Pearl came out on the stoop, her round face damp from the kitchen. He tried to sound casual. You know James, he better hurry or we'll miss the first picture. He's never been this late, Alfred. Why don't you go upstairs and call his house? Maybe he's sick. James ain't sick, Alfred stood up. How you know that? Her eyes narrowed. You know where he's at? Maybe. He's hanging out with those worthless punks, ain't he, Alfred? Maybe you just better... Alfred! But he was already off the stoop and moving fast, his sneakers slapping on the sidewalk. Packs of little kids, raggedy and skinny, raced past him along the gutter's edge, kicking empty beer cans ahead of them. Used to do that, too, when we were little, he thought. One thing I could always do better than James. I was always faster. Big deal. He slowed down. He stopped at the mouth of the alley and took a deep breath. What am I, James's shadow or something? I don't need him. But he marched to the basement steps and plunged down into the club room. Hollis and Sonny were sprawled on the long, sagging couch, snapping their fingers to a scratchy record. Major was flexing his arm muscles at the cracked mirror over the mop sink. Only James, trying to read a magazine in the dim light of the naked bulb, looked up. Hey man, what's happening? Nothing much, said Alfred. Ready to go to the movies? Not unless it's free night, said James. I got some money, said Alfred. Major turned slowly and let his muscles relax. How much you got, Alfred? Sonny and Hollis stopped snapping. I said, how much you got, Alfred? Nothing, mumbled Alfred, staring down at the tips of his sneakers. You the only one working. You got paid today, said Major. What you got? Gave it to my aunt, said Alfred. Gave it to my aunt, mimicked Major. You such a good, sweet boy. Old Uncle Alfred. Sonny giggled and Hollis grinned, buck-toothed. James looked away. Don't you know this club has got dues? Major folded his arms across his bulging T-shirt. Hollis leaned back in the couch. Go collect the dues, Sonny. Turn Alfred upside down and make the dues fall out his pockets. Turn Alfred upside down, echoed Sonny, blankly. He stood up taller than any of them and almost as heavily muscled as Major. Upside down. Hold on, said James. Alfred's my guest. I invited him to come down. Alfred took a step backwards, nearly knocking over an old wooden chair. Let's go, James. Major swaggered across the room, the metal tips on his pointed shoes clicking on the concrete floor. How much them Jews give you for slaving, Uncle Alfred? Jews squeeze the eagle till it screams, said Hollis. The eagle screams. Faster, Alfred. Sweep that floor, you skinny nigger. They've been all right to me, said Alfred. How come you ain't working right now, said Major, circling until he stood between Alfred and the door. Groceries closed. At eight o'clock, they close early on Friday to go to synagogue. They go pray for more dollars, said Hollis. Even James smiled. No, said Alfred. The Epsteins are very religious. They don't even touch money after sundown on Fridays. That's a lie, said Major. No, they even leave money in the cash register so they won't have to... He bit his lip. Water dripped into the mop sink. Small explosions in the suddenly silent room. Let's get it whispered Hollis. Show us, said Major. No, I... You just a slave, sneered Major. You was born a slave, you gonna die a slave. Slave, echoed Sonny. I see you now, boy, old and stooped, said Major, shuffling to the center of the room. Old and stooped. You be scratching your head and saying, Yes, sir, Mr. Lou. Let me brush them hairs off in your coat. Yes, sir, Mr. Jake. I be pleased if you allow me to wash your car. Sonny and Hollis began to laugh as Major shuffled around the dim, warm room, his muscular arms dangling like a monkey's, his eyes rolling, his black head bobbing in ugly imitation of an old-time Negro servant. I can see you now, Alfred, good old Uncle Alfred. Yes, sir, Mr. Ben, I'd be so gratified if and you'd kick me now and again. Show how much you white folks love us. The laughter rose, high-pitched and nervous. Alfred peeked at their faces, black and sweating in the semicircle around him. 
Hollis and Sonny grinning and nodding. James's chubby face was set and unsmiling as Major continued his imitation, scratching his nose, pouting his lips, and shambling loosely like a puppet at the end of jerking strings. Alfred's hands were wet. You come on with us, said James. You know just where to... We don't need him if he's scared, said Hollis. He isn't scared, not him, said James. Look, Alfred, you don't owe them anything. They gave me a job, said Alfred, surprised at how far away his own voice sounded. Oh, big job, said Hollis. Yes, sir, yelled Major, shuffling back into the center. Mr. Lou, I've been sweeping out your store forty year now. How about letting me deliver groceries on the bicycle once in a while? Alfred sh swallowed hard. They was the only ones gave me a job when I quit school, he yelled. They fell quiet again. You come on, Alfred, said James, softly. Whitey been stealing from us for three hundred years. We just gonna take some back. No. You could stay outside, be lookout, said James. Major shouldered in between them. You coming? Alfred shook his head. Let's go, said Major, moving toward the door. He turned at the first step, Sonny and Hollis at his heels. James? Let's go to the movies, James, said Alfred. That's all you ever want to do, said James. They stared at each other. You coming, James? Or you going to be a slave, too? James turned away. He followed the others up the steps to the street. The door banged shut behind them. Fool, thought Alfred. Had to open your mouth. He kicked the chair across the room. Good kick, man. Where's everybody going in such a hurry? Henry limped down into the club room, dragging his crippled left leg. The perpetual grin spread ac across his skinny face. Alfred shrugged. Play some cards? I gotta go, Henry. Hey, Alfred, you know what I'm doing now? Mr. Donatelli, the fight manager? He's letting me... Hey, where you going? Out. The stench of wine and garbage still hung in the moist June air. He jammed his hands into the pockets of his tight blue slacks, watching the cars cruise past. Another year, he thought, a B-18, able to drive. Sure, on grocery boy pay. Slave. The bells of the ice cream truck jangled across the street, and a sudden roar burst from a dozen transistor radios. Somebody must have hit a home run. The Epsteins would be in their synagogue now, wearing skull caps and praying. He started to walk toward his house and then stopped. Aunt Pearl would be sitting on the stoop, waving the fan the undertaker gave away at summer funerals. She would ask him why he wasn't with James, and she would know if he was lying. He went back down to the club room. Henry was punching at his reflection in the cracked mirror. He dropped his hands when he saw Alfred, and his big grin turned sheepish. Oh, shadow boxing, he said. Yeah. Mr. Donatelli's letting me work around the gym, take care of the gloves, and wash the mouthpieces. Big job. You ought to come up, Alfred. Willie Streeter's training now. He's going to fight in Madison Square Garden next week. Yeah. A lot of guys come up and train, said Henry. Yeah. Hey, man, where you... Out on the street again, he idly watched a green and white police cruiser slide by, a thick, hairy white arm hanging out of the open window. Alfred stiffened. The burglar alarm, the new silent burglar alarm installed at Epstein's the other night. How could I forget about that? They'd never hear it go off. It would ring in the detective's office, and they'd call the police right away. He began to run. Gotta get to James. Gotta tell James. But the radio inside the police car began to crackle and sputter as if it had read his mind. The car suddenly picked up speed. Silently, a second police car joined the first. They both wheeled around the corner, roaring into noise and light, motors growling, headlights glaring, sirens howling. Alfred slowed down as hundreds of people came off stoops and street corners and poured out of bars toward four cruisers parked behind Epstein's. The doors of the police cars were open, and the red roof lights were blinking. He heard shouts, and a voice yelled, Stop! Stop! A shot rang out, the warning shot. He started running again toward the shot, but the crowd thickened in front of him. They caught one, someone yelled from an upstairs window. The crowd surged forward, sweeping Alfred along. He tried to push through, but the crowd was too tightly packed. The man mumbled a voice off to his left, always looking to put his foot on a black throat. You saying the truth, brother. Only reason police up here to watch out for them white stores. So right. Police car doors slammed shut, and the cruisers drove away their sirens on. The crowd began...